Julio, in trying to understand consciousness, uh, you've given me a, a new way to think about it. I can't start with the brain, which is the way my whole life was organized. I have to start with the mind. So start me with the mind and then tell me this theory that you've uh, constructed in order to explain those characteristics of mind or consciousness. Precisely. So if you indeed accept that we want to start with consciousness to understand what could give rise to it, one can identify these key properties. And to list them very briefly, they are that it exists, it is structured, it's informative, is that particular way, it's integrated, it's always a single experience, and it is exclusive, meaning it's unique. It's, there's only one experience at the given time, and that's all. Once we start with these actions, which are properties of consciousness, we can ask, well, how does the world have to be, assuming there is a physical world out there, which most of us would assume there is, in order to account for these axioms? In order to generate the, it, it, those characteristics. Yes, so that it is indeed possible to have something like your own consciousness. And so the uh, integrated information theory of consciousness, which is essentially the name for this attempt to understand consciousness, is identifying some parallel postures to the axioms. So there is then the idea that whatever is out there should exist. That basically means having causal power. It can do things. So there is stuff out there that can do things. And one simple-minded version of that is that there are mechanisms out there. Now, a mechanism could be a neuron in your brain. It could be a logic gate in a computer. It could be anything, really. And to this day, you know, as physicists themselves don't know exactly what is the ultimate nature of reality in terms of what's out there. But let's just say, that's all we need, that there is stuff out there that does things. If you give them some inputs, they do some outputs based on the way they are built or so. So there are mechanisms out there. That is the posture that corresponds to the existence of consciousness. There is consciousness, there is an undeniable fact. Let's say there are things out there that do things, existence. Then we go to structured. Consciousness is structured, it has different aspects. This translates very simply into this mechanism can be structured too. That's another postulate. You can put together mechanisms in different ways, and they may do different things, depending how you structure them. No problem there. And there is information. So consciousness is that particular way. You're having this particular experience, which differs from all the other ones. Here the idea now is that a bunch of mechanism that we assume is out there and it is structured, is going to set things in a particular way. What do we mean by that? So what I usually say is that a set of mechanisms in a particular state, say now we are talking neurons, some are firing, are on, and some are not firing, they are off. It's just a particular set of mechanisms. Well, because they are neurons connected in a certain way, and some are on and some are off, they necessarily constrain past states of that system and future states of that system. So you have a bunch of neurons there in a particular state, some on, some off, now, at time zero. Well, that is going to necessarily constrain how things could have possibly been for that system at t minus one, one time step in the past, whatever that is, let's say 100 milliseconds, and at t plus one, one time step in the future. So if you are a mechanism in a state, you necessarily are going to constrain the past and the future of the system of which you are part. That is the idea then, that information can be captured if you can exactly specify how a set of mechanisms in a state constrains the past and the future of the very same system. When you say past and future, that can be a very small past and future to create whatever is happening at that moment. If the neuron is firing, that meant it had to have certain input or at least certain potential in its membranes or something. Uh, but it, the, the, the period of time that you're constraining is not a very long period of time. Yes, the, exactly what the period of time is, in fact, is something that can be derived from the theory in the sense that the idea here is that information is a difference that makes a difference, okay? So if you're a mechanism in a state, okay. it means that you make a difference to the past and you make a okay. difference to the future. You constrain it in a particular way. If you don't make a difference, you don't exist. Okay. And we see that existence is necessary for consciousness. Okay. If you do make a difference, you exist. But which particular kind of difference do you make? That's how, what we want to measure with information, okay? okay? Then we go to integration. Integration is also something about difference that make a difference. If you have a system and you can divide it into parts which are completely independent, say, because they don't interact at all, well then I would say that it makes no sense to say that the system exists. 
because it does not exist above and beyond its parts. It's, the whole is not more than the sum of the parts, in other words. Because you could say, if my system A, B, doesn't do anything more than what A does alone and B does alone, then I have no reason to invoke the existence of A, B. Yeah. I am just do just as well with the parts A and B. Mm -hmm. So this can be formalized, and you can ask for any system of mechanisms, does it do something, does it constrain the past and the future as a system? above and beyond what its parts do. And it must do that. It must do that, because if it doesn't, if it can be reduced to its parts, yeah. then it doesn't exist. You might as well throw it out right, of the right, window right. and nothing would change. Right. It wouldn't make right. any difference. They didn't okay? have to be together, they could exactly. be independent. Right. And, uh, and the theory says that you can essentially systematically evaluate this. It's not easy to do, but it's not inconceivable. And we do it for very simple systems. You can actually cut the system into parts in all kinds of ways. and. If you find, for instance, a particular cut such that it makes no difference to how the system constrains the past and the future, then it doesn't exist. But if in a system you don't find a cut like that, any cut you do, something changes. Mm -hmm. okay? The system now does certain things differently. It's, it constrains the past and the future typically much less than before. Then it does something as a whole. The whole is more than the sum of its parts. And integration can be measured precisely. In fact, it's called integrated information. It's how much the whole specifies the past and the future more than the parts. That's the integration part of the theory. And finally, remember there is the axiom of exclusion. That is, every experience is only one, is unique. It includes certain things and it excludes others. You are conscious at the moment of the color, the shape, the space, and all of those things. But you're not conscious of only parts of them. It's the whole thing. But you're not conscious of more than that. For instance, you're not conscious of the value of your blood pressure right now. Mm -hmm. So there is one experience, and it flows at a particular time. One experience every 100 milliseconds. What does that translate to? It into a tenth of a second. Yeah, tenth of a second. So then the idea here is that a system of mechanisms, which has to be informative, constrain the past and the future, it must be one, it cannot be subdivided into independent components, must, only be, must be the only one. And what is the only one? It's the one that makes the most of a difference. So if you take a set of elements, you're going to do all these calculations to see what anything does, if it does it above and beyond the parts, and then you say, of all these possible elements, a set of elements, of all these possible systems, which one is the one that makes the most difference? And the theory says the one that makes the most difference is the only one that really exists from the inside, from what we call the intrinsic perspective. And so within your brain, for instance, the claim would be that there is a set of neurons right now that as a system makes the most of a difference to itself in the past and in the future. And no smaller set of that, those neurons minus a few, and no larger set of that, those neurons plus a few, is equally effective in constraining the past and the future. That's you. We certainly know that most of the neurons in my brain are not necessary for consciousness. I could lose my whole cerebellum, which is like a little brain in the back of my head. I might not be able to walk very uh, uh, steadily, or my table tennis game would deteriorate pretty badly, but I would still feel I'm me. Yes, so the idea is that if we could do this analysis, which can only be done for simple systems right now in a rigorous way, but if we could do it for you right now, we would, uh, of course, find that you are a whole very complicated connected set of cells, to say the least, not to say molecules and atoms. And that goes all the way from, you know, your toes up to the neurons in your gut, up to your brain. And then there is, within your brain, there is the spinal cord, uh, there is the cerebellum, all these other things, they're all connected. But the theory says that there is only one particular set of neurons is not going to be a whole brain and certainly not your whole body, right. which is the one that generates your particular experience right now. Mm -hmm. It's the maximum of irreducibility. It's the most integrated part inside your brain. So in the end, the theory puts all these axioms into postulates, and these postulates make very precise uh, predictions about what it takes to generate an experience. In short, it says that an experience is a maximally irreducible structure made by mechanisms, and it's a particular set of mechanisms that does it, only one. In the end, putting together these axioms and translating them into postulates, the integrated information theory says that whatever is out there, in order to generate consciousness, your experience right now, 
must be a set of mechanisms that make a difference. It can be structured, different subset of mechanisms do different things. It must specify things, constrain the past and the future in a particular way. It must be do so in a way that's irreducible, meaning you can split this and mm -hmm. still mm -hmm. make no difference. And it is that particular set of mechanism that is maximally irreducible. That's called uh, what it does, how it constrains the past and the future, the set of mechanisms that satisfy this property is called a maximally irreducible conceptual structure. That's the technical term. But that basically means that there is a set of mechanisms, like neurons, for instance, that forms a completely irreducible set, is the most irreducible of all, that says the past must have been that particular way and the future must be that particular way. And that, says the theory, is actually what an experience is. The theory clearly states that one experience is a maximally irreducible conceptual structure. And I emphasize is. It's not correlated with or corresponding to an experience is that. Like in physics, this is now an identity. An experience is a maximally irreducible conceptual structure in a particular space that's called qualia space, which is the space where each dimension is a possible past state and future state of a system. Identity theory is well known in uh, the mind-body problem because neuroscientists uh, have said and do say today that states of the brain are in that same three-line identity exactly the same thing as a, uh, a perception, whether, you know, firings in the C fibers or pain or a certain pattern in your brain is, uh, is literally the same thing. Now, many philosophers criticize that. How can flows of calcium ions and electrical potentials be the, the sense of experience that we have? That how can one literally be the other? It's a category mistake. Well, that's obviously not true because uh, there is a brain state right now in your cerebellum where 60 billion neurons are some firing, some not, and there is nothing it is like to be a cerebellum. So it can't be that experience is just a state of neurons. What the integrated information theory says is that an experience is a maximally integrated conceptual structure which is not made of neurons. It is in a space which is called qualia space which constrains past and future of a system. You can do it with neurons, you could potentially do it with something else. But what the identity is, is not between neurons and states of consciousness. It's between these shapes, this set of constraints on past and future of a system and the experiences. So it's very different from saying a neural state is an experience.